Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I am David Thiel. This is Alex Stamos and uh, Justine Osborne. Uh, we're consultants with uh, ISEC Partners and are here to talk a little bit about uh, some new uh, web application frameworks uh, that move web applications a lot more onto the desktop and give them a lot more power than uh, you're used to. Um, so uh, there are a bunch of different uh, vendors and frameworks that we have to get through uh, in a limited amount of time, so I'm going to go pretty quick through uh, the introduction here. But um, the uh, ARIA is a term uh, that was invented to describe uh, applications that behave a little bit more like desktop apps than uh, a regular web application. Um, they are all fairly different, uh, but there are some things that they have in common. Uh, they tend to make heavy use of AJAX type calls, uh, so uh, asynchronous updates to pages. Uh, they introduce a lot of new local storage mechanisms, uh, including uh, DOM storage, and uh, we'll talk about later some SQL databases. Um, they tend to uh, lean towards having an offline mode uh, so that you can sync, uh, you know, sync up your webmail or something like that. and. Uh, go onto a plane and still continue to use a web application or uh, you know, one of these apps to uh, continue to work just like it were a desktop app. Um, some of them break out of the browser entirely. Uh, some of them utilize existing browsers. Um, and yeah, others are basically like installing a new little mini web browser on your machine. Uh, they also have uh, increased privilege in general over what a normal web application has. Uh, they're able to store data locally. Um, they can open their own sockets. They can read and write to files. Um, it's uh, essentially a way to turn web apps into full-fledged desktop apps. Um, so uh, basically, everybody started uh, with desktop applications. Uh, they moved all of their applications into web browsers and decided it wasn't a very good idea. Uh, and I guess so now we uh, um, move them back onto the desktop, and this is progress. So um, the reasons why you would uh, want to use uh, one of these applications, um, it's becoming more sexy than regular Web 2.0 stuff. Um, it also, it does give you a little bit of a benefit in terms of responsiveness. Uh, you can have large local data stores locally and cache them uh, and use those. Um, we talked about desktop integration. Um, you can also write these entirely in HTML, JavaScript, Flash, uh, things that uh, web application developers are all familiar with. Uh, you don't really have to write a lot of new code, um, and uh, it's all pretty easy. Um, so. It, uh, you know, on the good side of things, it means that people that, uh, you know, only have experience writing web applications and web content can write full desktop apps, and if they have good ideas, then we can get cooler applications. Um, but it's, uh, you know, potentially not that great of a thing because there's a fairly low uh, barrier to entry, uh, and there are, the, you know, the amount of privilege that these applications have is uh, increased a, a fair bit over your traditional web browser app. So uh, these are the ones we're going to look at. There are the, um, you know, these five major vendors uh, that are all competing for, uh, uh, you know, the next big API and way to handle these type of uh, applications. Uh, and Alex, we'll start off with uh, Adobe Air. Great. Thanks, Dave. So Adobe Air, we, we have these nice little graphics, um, which it turns out would take 12 seconds in PowerPoint and took David about two days in LaTeX. Um, <laughs> Uh, just as a, a quick comparison of the, the, the full, how full-fledged the feature set is for each of these different frameworks. Um, as you can see, everything's checked here because uh, Adobe uh, Air can do just about anything. Um, uh, Adobe Air is, it, it, while it's called a rich internet application framework, um, sometimes by Adobe and, and often uh, in the press, um, it really is more of a it actually totally is a full feature desktop runtime, right? It should consider it kind of like .NET or Java or any kind of other cross-platform runtime um, that has the full-fledged run of the desktop to do anything the heck it wants. Um, it's <coughs> cross-browser and cross-platform. Uh, right now, uh, they've released it for OS X and Windows. Um, but uh, Pellis, you want to wave to everybody? Uh, Pellis Uli from Adobe will take your request for your favorite open source operating system uh, and you know prioritize that they'll get right on the NetBSD development 
uh, real soon. Um, you can make these applications in, in multiple different environments. You can use Adobe Flex or Adobe Flash, which are commercial products that uh, a lot of graphic designers and web designers are already familiar with. But you can also make these uh, applications with free tools, uh, just writing uh, text, HTML, and JavaScript and using a compiler that you can get for free from Adobe. In that case, the, 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 the basic system here, the basic unit here is the Flash Swift that is uh, runs within the Flash virtual machine. Um, so in the HTML and JavaScript case, uh, that gets compiled within a uh, uh, Swift that is provided by Adobe, a container Swift um, that then you don't have to write yourself. Uh, but then they expose lots of cool functionality th through JavaScript uh, so that you can do more things that you can normally do in HTML JavaScript. Uh, this is much more intent. It is intended to be more powerful than a general RIA application. Um, there's no sandbox. Apps run with the full power of the user. So. Because it's a desktop application, shouldn't we just write it off as, if it's malicious, that's fine. If it's not, that's fine. It's all up to the user. Not really, right? It's not just like a normal, say, Win32 program on a desktop. Um, the, the power of Air is the I in RIA. It's the internet connectivity part. Um, it is very, RIA, uh, Air apps, by, uh, are very easy to launch. It, it's an optional thing for the developer, but it's very easy to make it so that Air applications can be launched by web browsers, by sites, um, and I think that's the way they're normally going to be used. So that if you go to, say, eBay, eBay has their own Air application. Uh, one day, it, eBay is probably going to turn it on. So if you go to eBay and you have the app turned on, that they, they launch the RIA application so you can get the richer interface than the web interface. Um, so they can be invoked by browsers. Um, they have a lot of native mechanisms for uh, loading external content. If you're writing a Win32 program in C++, you have to do a lot of work to download, say, a Flash Swift fly, file and play a movie, right? That's one line of code or two lines of code uh, in Actions in Adobe Air. So it's very easy for developers to bring down content from untrusted places and run it locally within this desktop application. Um, and it's highly likely that's going to happen, right? Uh, it would be really stupid to go just write a full desktop app that has no internet connectivity with Air. It's not the thing that you write that the next competitor to Office in. It's a thing that you write that has tight internet integration and lots of media capability. So really, it's probably better to think of Adobe Air like ActiveX or fulltrust.net applications. Um, the, the code runs as full privileges, um, and there is some, some code prevention and sandboxing uh, techniques there. Um, but l like ActiveX, once it's installed, it can do anything the heck it wants. Um, Fortunately, Adobe seems to have learned a couple things from ActiveX, and we'll talk about that. So error applications are identified by two things. Uh, there's an app ID and a publisher ID. Um, the publisher ID is a, a big, long, entropic-looking string uh, that is calculated by the person's information that they add into a certificate, and then the public key of a certificate that is generated for each developer. Um, the app ID uh, is just a string that is decided by, by that developer. Um, Air applications can't be launched directly from, you can't just use an object tag or call them from JavaScript like an ActiveX control. Uh, you have to launch them from inside of a, a Flash file itself. So to launch an Air application, you load up a Flash file, just a normal jailed Swift, and then within that Flash file, um, they pull down air.swift, uh, is, is Adobe's recommended way of doing it, uh, which is a Flash file that now adds more functionality to your local Flash 9 instance. Uh, unfortunately, there's no secure way of doing this. You can't do HTTPS here uh, because it turns out to be Akamized. Um, if you want to do it securely, you should copy air.swift to your local site and then change this URL to do HTTPS to your local site. Um, once that, that those classes are now defined within your, your execution environment, your Flash execution environment, you can then check to see if an application is installed and get its version. Um, this means... Uh, once you have Air Apps installed, any site you go to can find out what Air Apps you have installed, uh, which is fine for some Air Apps. Uh, if you have the My Little Pony MM org uh, written in Adobe Air, perhaps that's the kind of thing that you don't want to expose. There's no way that you can prevent um, uh, uh, malicious Flash uh, applets from finding out what Air Apps you have installed and exactly what version. Um, and once we know, hey, it's installed, uh, it's a pretty simple to just launch it. Um, calling a new function called launch application, giving it the app ID, the pub ID, and then arguments. That's an array of arguments of, of, of objects that get passed to it. Um, so this can be passed from a non-trusted Flash Swift into a trusted Adobe Air application. Um, by default, the code that runs in an Air application runs with full writes. Um, they've added a bunch of classes to JavaScript or ActionScript, depending on what you're using to write your Air application in, to do a bunch of dangerous stuff, like talk to files locally and install um, in program files. And you can write stuff over Windows System 32 and such. Um, 
with the existing capabilities in Air 1.1, um, it is possible to make a local system run native code into backdoor an operating system. Um, there are rumors on blogs that talk about it that Adobe will eventually add more things like shell execute and stuff. There's no actual security downside there. You already have full control. Uh, it'll just make it maybe a little bit easier for people. Um, you don't actually have a code access security model like .NET or Java uh, where you have method per method or class by class control over what a, an application can call. Um, instead, they've created five predefined sandboxes. Um, the application sandbox is the default sandbox that your application boots up in. You can do anything you want. Um, there's the remote sandbox, which is if you pull stuff down from the internet, like a Swift from the internet, or you open up an iframe to an HTML page on, on the internet, then that's going to, by default, run in the remote sandbox. And there's three others that if we had multiple hours we could talk about, but you guys probably don't care about, kind of intermediate ones. Um, to when you load that external data, it automatically goes into the remote sandbox, right? So an important part of their security model is that stuff that runs in the application sandbox, the local code that's doing all the dangerous stuff, should not be able to do uh, just-in-time execution. It shouldn't be able to pull code down and then install it, right? Flash used to have the ability that you could take a, a byte string and create a, a Flash class out of it and call it. You can't do that. You can't run the JavaScript eval command, for example, right? You can't have a script tag that does a cross-domain source. Um, so they've, they've, they've worked really hard to find all the things that will allow you to get commands from the Internet and not allow them the application sandbox. On the other side, there's the remote sandbox, um, the remote sandbox can't do dangerous stuff, but it can do things like evals and pull down uh, Swifts from remote that run locally and pull down JavaScript remotely um, and can do cross-domain XML HP requests depending on some things. Um, this is probably the su a sufficient place for most developers to write their code. Um, unfortunately, though, they're going to be running the, the application de uh, sandbox by default. Um, so these are some reasonable security pro protections that Adobe has probably worked very hard to put in. Um, obviously, uh, because they're reasonable security protections, web developers are going to work really hard to circumvent them, um, which is you know the history of how this kind of stuff works. Uh, so one thing they could do is look for mistakes that Adobe made in the classification of methods that are dangerous or not dangerous. Um, that's you know not not easy. We've looked a little bit. Um, it seems like they've done a reasonable job of classifying uh, the stuff that can't run the application sandbox, that's dynamic code, and classifying the dangerous stuff that, that can't run the remote sandbox. But better yet, they provide a mechanism that allows you to, to move information back and forth between these sandboxes. It's called the sandbox bridge. Um, basically, the way it works um, is Say I have an application that runs in the application sandbox. It can do anything the heck it wants. Um, and it wants to load up an iframe. Um, and in that iframe is going to be untrusted code from the Internet. But it has to expose some kind of functionality to that untrusted code. Um, you create an object, like here we call the high write stuff object. Um, we give it a method called write to file. And we put a bunch of dangerous stuff in there. And it takes a couple of arguments. Um, and then we attach that object to what's called the parent sandbox bridge, uh, which is an, uh, uh, already exists. Um, and then one, once we've attached the parent sandbox bridge, uh, we call and we say, here's an iframe, pull down some dangerous stuff. And then the code in the iframe, say JavaScript, can say, OK, parent sandbox bridge, thank you for giving me that function, that dangerous function, I'm going to use it. Um, it's kind of like setting a set UID bit on a, on a, on a method. Um, if this is a variable, it's passed by copying. It's not passed by reference. But obviously, it has to be some kind of passing by reference uh, if it's a function like this, because it does run with the permissions of the parent. Um, so in this example, this was a very bad move, right? Um, in this case, the developer created a function that can take an arbitrary file name and arbitrary content and then write it to the hard drive and then exposed it to the, 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 the untrusted code running an iframe. Um, and so in this case, they have, you know, with only a couple lines of code, the web developer, or uh, the Air developer, they're not web developers anymore, right? Now they're empowered to be desktop developers. So the, the desktop developer that doesn't know how to use anything but, but HTML and JavaScript um, has gone and ruined the entire Adobe sandbox model. Um, you know, Adobe has to provide some kind of way for doing the communication, but it looks like it is going to be pretty easy for people to shoot themselves in the foot. Um, Air requires Flash 9. Uh, Air itself is an add-on to Flash that the first time you load an Air app, um, Adobe provides a sample code uh, called, I think, badge.swift uh, that will automatically have the Air 
uh, methods loaded up, and it gives you this little pop-up, do you want to install Adobe Air? Um, no real security warnings or anything. This actually isn't like too dangerous a thing. It comes down as a signed binary and, and installs. Um, once the Air run, runtime is installed in Flash, um, Air applications can be installed. Uh, they can be bundled as .air files, which are uh, binaries that contain a bunch of Swifts and an XML file and stuff like that, uh, zip files. Um, they can also be installed from a web page. Uh, if you have a Swift, it can call the install application function. That pops a thin, uh, little thing that says, do you want to open this file or save it? Um, after that, you get a prompt like this. Um, every single Air application has to be signed uh, by either a trusted root cert, and they've got three CAs, I believe, that can issue those certs, um, or they have to be signed by a self-signed cert. So um, this is what you get with if it comes from a trusted cert. Uh, if uh, you paid more than $120, there'd be projectors here uh, that could actually show you this text. Um, but I'll read it for you. It says publisher, um, which is a publisher name that's pulled from the certificate. Uh, it says a application. Um, this is an application name that is controlled by the bad guy. So you can put, not necessarily the bad guy, the Adobe Air uh, developer. The Air developer can put anything they want in there. Um, and then it says system access unrestricted. Um, and then this little green icon says verified. And then the little red icon says system access unrestricted. The application may access your file system in the internet, uh, which may put your computer at risk. While technically accurate, this is perhaps not a strong enough warning to tell people, hey, by the way, if this is malicious, it can do whatever the heck it wants to your desktop. Um, if it is unsigned, oh, and also the default selection is installed, so if you hit space or enter, um, you're going to automatically install it. Um, if you do a self-signed certificate, they don't show the publisher. They say unknown, but they do still publish up the application name. Um, in this case, it's a string of Chinese characters I can't read, um, and this is an application I downloaded from adobe.com, um, published apparently by a Chinese person uh, with a self-signed certificate, um, and they say that the publisher identity can't be uh, determined, and it still has unrestricted access. Um, as of right now, there's there's no way to turn off the bottom that says unrestricted access because there's no version of air that doesn't run with full access, right? So that's always says red unrestricted. Um, this kind of looks like pre-Internet Explorer 7 ActiveX controls, right? Um, just like Microsoft, Adobe has decided we're going to give people the, you know, the information necessary to make an intelligent decision. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the, the level of skill needed to make that intelligent decision includes um, understanding the public-private key cryptography of uh, how the Flash virtual machine works and whether or not Adobe Air is a desktop runtime. So for all you guys now, you can make that decision intelligently. Um, if, I give this, if we give this talk another uh, something like 120 million times, then we should cover the internet using uh, populace, and everybody will be able to make that uh, correctly. Um, but for the most part, just like with ActiveX, giving people the correct information is, might not be enough. Um, right? Uh, the ActiveX gave that right information, and their legacy became malware, uh, that people would click yes to anything because they couldn't make that intelligent decision. Uh, so, you know, and this kind of scary thing is that uh, these days, the Flash virtual machine is much more popular than Internet Explorer actually has ever been, right? They have a more dominant position in the Internet market than Internet Explorer ever had. Um, and so it might be a, a, a much better way to seed malware. Um, so our suggestions, changing the default action on the, on the signed certificate. Um, adding a, a countdown timer, at least in the self-signed uh, section, so that people have to read the warning. Um, there is a registry key to turn off self-signed certificate support. Um, it's Right now, it's allowed by default. Uh, there are reasonable reasons why you'd want to support self-signed certificates, but I don't think it's a reasonable thing to have turned on by default for most consumers, um, so flipping it. Um, and then I don't think Air should, or Adobe should be advertising self-signed um, Air binaries from their own site, from adobe.com. Uh, it's probably better for Adobe to enforce uh, people getting real certificates uh, and perhaps uh, doing a couple of sanity checks on the Air apps before they come through. Uh, it's you know right now you can upload any Air app to adobe.com. It's going to be exposed to a lot of people. It might be a very good way to seed malware with Adobe looking to to give a, a grant of imprimatur that this is a reasonable thing. Um, I, we also think that there's probably some room between totally jailed air and completely free loose, I'm sorry, totally jailed flash and completely free loose air. Most of the applications that probably are going to want to use air don't need to install a rootkit, right? That's not a function that, you know, the eBay online store really needs. Well, maybe they think they need it, um, but I, I don't think that for their business model as of now, um, they're going to need that kind of functionality. So perhaps in Air 2 or Air 3, we will see a middle ground solution here where you can install an Air application that can't do um, anything willy-nilly. Okay. So we'll have questions at the end because we're going to run out of time, but for now we'll turn it over to Justine to talk about Silverlight. 
Hi. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of Silverlight. Um, so Silverlight is a browser plugin, uh, comparable in functionality to Flash. Um, oh. <laughs> it, uh, it claims to be cross-platform, um, but currently Linux support is uh, left as an exercise to the community. Um, it uh, supports a subset of the .NET framework. Um, and there's two versions. Silverlight 1 is in, has it been finally released, and Silverlight 2 is in the beta version. Um, so both Silverlight 1 and Silverlight 2 use uh, XAML to uh, uh, render uh, DUI. So XAML stands for the Extensible Application Markup Language. Um, and Silverlight 1 uses JavaScript for dynamic content. Silverlight 2 introduces the core CLR, which is a slimmed down version of the .NET CLR um, for dynamic content. So here's an example of some XAML uh, markup. Um, so this is a, um, this is a, language similar to um, HTML. You can uh, create little widgets like a slider. Um, it's very simple and easy for uh, designer, intuitive for designers to pick up. So this is what that markup renders in Silverlight. Um, okay, Silverlight uh, security model is um, based on uh, the .NET CLR security model. So code access security. Um, very briefly, code access security is security based on code identity. So your, your code gets different privileges depending on where it's from. So if it's from the internet, it's going to have less privileges. Um, so Silverlight um, has simplified uh, classic code access security um, so that the developer can only write transparent code. Um, and then they can call into security, they can call into critical code with security safe critical APIs, which Microsoft um, writes, and they are signed with the Microsoft public key. Um, so that's how the sandbox uh, works. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, I, I can't, in my Silverlight application, um, call file.create uh, because that's critical code. Um, the second example um, will succeed because I'm calling uh, from a safe critical API, um, which does stuff like input validation, um, as is shown in the example, the third example, which will fail um, because it's trying to do something nasty like talk to the modem. So isolated storage is an example of one of the safe critical APIs and um, some of the power that Silverlight has. Um, access to the local system. And you can uh, deny local storage, um, so that's a good thing to know. Um, and network sockets is another um, way that Silverlight allows uh, the browser plugin to access the local system. Um, and it requires a client access policy. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the cross-domain um, and Silverlight. So Silverlight uh, fall, honors the same uh, cross-domain policy as Flash. So it will accept a cross-domain.xml file. Um, Silverlight, by default, should only be able to call back to its uh, domain of origin. But you can configure cross-domain uh, access with uh, these policy files. Um, and client access policy is Silverlight's version of the cross-domain.xml. Um, one of the interesting things that um, Silverlight has that Flash doesn't is um, the ability to turn off access to the hosting DOM. So you can embed Silverlight um, applications in the DOM and um, disallow them from, uh, I mean, sorry, in uh, a web page and disallow them from accessing the DOM. Um, so um, the big deal here is that the attack surface is really in the um, safe critical APIs, and that's really Microsoft's job to uh, um, to maintain. So uh, that offers some control um, with patching and um, whatnot. Um, and then the other kind of the other attack surface is really uh, denial of service attacks against uh, the user because uh, Silverlight has access to the local system. Um, Silverlight applications don't have to exit. It's up to the developer to implement that functionality. 
So um, uh, really brief overview, but that's, there's some fun stuff to play with here and a lot more work to be done. So I'll pass it over to David. So um, the frameworks that, uh, that we've talked about so far have been uh, kind of ways to write full-fledged desktop applications. Um, they're, you know, in the case of Air, it's totally outside of the browser with, uh, you know, some ways to interact with it. Um, the, some of the frameworks uh, that we have coming up here, uh, including Google Gears, Yahoo Browser Plus, and uh, Mozilla Prism, are all more based around the browser, um, but give uh, extra capabilities. So you can see here that uh, Gears doesn't have a, a whole lot um, you know, that, that it can do. Uh, it does allow for running disconnected, um, and that's the, the main goal of Gears, is to, to cache content locally and make it so a web app can be a local app. Um, so what uh, the things that Gears consists of, uh, there's an API for syncing data uh, between your local machine and site. Uh, there's a SQLite instance locally that actually uh, stores, your, uh, stores the data for that syncing. Um, there's also a, uh, a locally running application server. Um, so you've got a browser plugin that actually, if you're disconnected, it'll, uh, it'll cache content and serve it back up to you uh, from a local web server. Um, there, uh, let's uh, we'll skip to. So the other cool thing is that uh, there are worker pools um, in Gears, and these are a method for if you have really intensive JavaScript calculations uh, to offload them to be processed by something else, rather than actually uh, running inside the browser where you might lock the UI or diminish user experience. Uh, so, for the most part, the mechanisms that are in Gears uh, just utilize the same origin as a, you know, as a security precaution. They do give uh, the ability to use uh, parameterized SQL statements for uh, accessing the local database stores, um, and they do prompt for install. Um, it's not uh, a really awesome prompt uh, and doesn't give users a lot of information um, because in uh, Gears 0 0.3, which is uh, still the current version, I believe, um, they introduced the ability for developers to uh, basically have the uh, security warning to look however they want it to. Um, so here uh, is a pretty trivial, uh, trivial example. If you actually, um, if you saw the Jafar talk, it turns out that there at least used to be a way to actually spoof the, um, the real URL. But what you have here is the friendly name up top. Um, and if you just make the friendly name look like a, in a legitimate site, you can actually customize the, the icon here so that it looks like a lock, um, which makes people want to click yes on things. And um, you can try and convince the user in whatever way possible uh, to actually allow this. It's not, um, it doesn't really give you any information as to what could go wrong uh, when you're accepting this kind of prompt. Um, and I'll kind of get into what can actually go wrong a bit here. Um, Suffice it to say that allowing developers to customize security prompts is not a great idea. Um, but uh, so with worker pools, uh, one of the neat things about worker pools, uh, because they don't uh, lock up the UI or um, you know, make your browser run slow, uh, you can actually use them for things that uh, would otherwise trigger, say, Firefox's uh, you know, runaway script detection, where it says, hey, this page is taking a really long time to respond. Do you want to let it keep going or not? Um, because it's so easy to get somebody to actually uh, allow a site to use gears, uh, you can actually uh, use this to do things like push a bunch of hashes down to these machines uh, and do hash crack. I mean, JavaScript is not the fastest way to crack hashes, uh, but if you have an a army of people that are all coming to your website and clicking yes and allowing you to use gears, you can actually run this stuff in the background. They go off and surf elsewhere. You can have it serve up the answers when it gets them. Uh, and it turns out that this actually works uh, reasonably well. Um, so the components of Gears are, are pretty simple. Um, Yahoo Browser Plus kind of goes in a, uh, a weird direction where the, the idea of uh, Browser Plus is making it so that uh, developers, rather than, uh, you know, writing a, you know, using a little framework for, uh, you know, local data storage or other, um, mechanisms like that, uh, it basically makes it really easy to write your own modular browser plugins. Uh, so because nobody understands uh, NP API um, and very few browser plugins exist, uh, Yahoo decided that a way to make uh, powerful web applications would be to write something that would allow people to just push down new browser plugins uh, that run with full privilege. 
Um, so it's uh, there. Uh, there has been some attempt at uh, putting security into this uh, this framework. Um, their inspiration for uh, for a good security model has been that of uh, browser developers, um, which for something that actually allows you to run desktop applications uh, is there could probably be a, a stronger model to follow. Um, so you actually uh, you initialize this over an insecure connection uh, back to Yahoo. Uh, it's another place where, who knows, because it's optimized or something, uh, you can't do it over SSL. Um, so the first time you actually install it, you don't even have to restart your browser. It uh, installs this plugin and starts handling this stuff, and it'll push down on demand uh, components that are necessary for the web application. Um, a couple of things that are included are uh, a locally running version of Image Magic uh, to do image transforms, um, which has traditionally not been uh, a terribly bug free code. Um, there's a little sample app for uploading stuff to Flickr, uh, notifications for Growl and Snarl to kind of poke into the OS notification framework, uh, and an embedded Ruby interpreter. Uh, so uh, this actually allows you to write further browser plugins in Ruby. Um, so it's kind of this mashup of ancient uh, plugin technology with new, sexy, um, slow interpreted languages. Um, but uh, so these, of course, all run uh, on the local machine uh, with full user privilege. Uh, it's basic. It's worse than ActiveX, as near as I can tell. Um, the the Ruby version that was shipping up until uh, a week or two ago was actually the same version that some people might have heard about that has uh, uh, that had really trivial overflows uh, in both arrays and strings. Um, so, you know, precaution to developers: as long as you don't actually develop any um, application using a range of strings, um, you're perfectly safe. Um, so they, it's not something that was actually hanging out there for a really long t time, and that's a really old version of Ruby, so uh, it doesn't seem like there's, there's been a lot of focus on uh, you know, keeping this stuff up to date. Uh, but admittedly, uh, it's in a, a preview phase, uh, and part of the reason for that is because they're trying to figure out how they can do this without making uh, everything uh, entirely insecure. Uh, and... I can't really see a way that that's going to happen. Um, right now, there's a there is a framework uh, for uh, for actually signing uh, these uh, these modules, um, but they also accept calls from outside sources. Uh, so if you can get any kind of code execution in these modules, you can actually clobber the whitelist that allows uh, that says where you can load uh, Browser Plus uh, plugins from or correlates, uh, and you can also uh, change the uh, verification procedure. All of these can clobber each other. Um, there's no protections uh, against um, against any of them. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, not that great of an idea. Um, so, uh, it's this might be able to be turned into something usable um, it, it, from a security perspective. Uh, but in general, as it stands right now, uh, there's with no sandboxing at all, um, it would probably um, be a really easy way to install um, to install malware. Um, so actually, probably my favorite of these frameworks uh, are the ones that try and use a standards-based approach um, rather than trying to invent new APIs and that aren't cross-platform and uh, making people install them. Uh, Prism is actually uh, is actually pretty simple in concept. Uh, what it uh, what it is is just a way to encapsulate a, a website into kind of a, a Chromeless standalone browser, um, and they set up their own little profiles and they're locked to one site. Uh, if you you click on links to another site, it'll actually open in a browser, just like if you did in, if you're in an email application. Uh, it just passes it to the browser. It doesn't try and follow that stuff around, uh, which is a good design. Um, and there's no, you can't even override SSL certificate failures, which is also uh, a pretty decent idea. Um, they're really trivial to make. In their most basic form, all they need is an INI file that says uh, where to go, uh, some CSS layout stuff, some JavaScript rules, uh, and things like that. Uh, there's a couple of uh, Prism apps running together. You can see that they, uh, you know, they'll sit around in the taskbar, and you can, you know, uh, they don't have any location bars or anything like that. You can write something that looks like a full app, like Thunderbird or something, um, and it's, you know, not even necessarily apparent that it's a web app. 
Um, the place where Prism falls down is that the actual JavaScript UI that you install uh, has full XPCOM scripting privileges. Um, so this is the language that people write Firefox add-ons in. Um, so a anything that you can think of a, a Firefox add-on, add-in, um, you know, that it can do, uh, you can basically do in one of these web app bundles, uh, which is a little bit of overkill, uh, since you don't really need to change a whole lot uh, in these bundles. They're, you know, they're, it's a pretty simple idea. Um, so with Firefox add-ons, you have a simple way for people to... Um, uh, you know, there's a signing mechanism, there's an install prompt, there's a counter, there's a de uh, fairly good explanation to the users that, uh, you know, this is not necessarily safe code. Um, in Prism, what you get is just uh, what looks like a bookmark dialog. And, uh, you know, you check a couple of boxes if you want it to behave differently than the default, you say where you want it to go. Uh, with no warnings or anything. Um, so it turns out that you can actually use this XPCOM scripting privilege to do things like, um, right now, that people just host their web app bundles on a remote site, and they say, hey, I've made a bundle for such and such site, encapsulating that, go ahead and install it. Um, it turns out you can do things like uh, have that, uh, you know, if you had a webmail.com uh, bundle, you can just do things like change people's proxy configuration settings to go through a server of your own, um, it, or relay content to other places. Um, it's, it's really a lot more functionality than anybody would really need to, to add here. Um, so the the idea of Prism is actually, uh, I think, pretty sound. Uh, the XPCOM scripting privileges should really go away, especially since they're actually starting to push this. I think it's one of the featured add-ons uh, for Firefox that uh, you know they want people to install. Um, outside of the uh, outside of the Prism framework, there's actually functionality in HTML5 and new browsers like uh, in, in WebCon, WebKit and Firefox um, that allow you to do a lot of RIA type stuff um, you know, cross platform without having to lock people into uh, you know proprietary solution. Um, you may have heard of DOM storage, and this is a, a new or parts of it are a new mechanism uh, that were introduced in uh, Firefox and WebKit. They give you a couple of different mechanisms to store data locally. Um, they give you uh, session storage and local storage. Session storage is just per session. Local storage is a big uh, 5 meg data store um, that you can use. Um, you can have access to a local SQLite database now uh, through the open database function. Um, so you can create your own databases just like you were creating a cookie. Um, and uh, you know these are all protected by same origin restrictions, but they have uh, a couple of other interesting facets. So the reason why DOM storage is introduced, you can do uh, local caching, uh, you can do user tracking um, without having to ever prompt the user or let them know that you're doing it. Um, you can, uh, it gets around the things that web developers don't like about cookies, which is that people delete them or they refuse them and they have to write code to say, oh, that this person turned cookies off, things like that. Um, this gets around a lot of that. Uh, you have a really big data store and you can, uh, you know, load whatever you want into it, uh, and like I say, it's a it's an excellent tracking mechanism. The other thing is that now that SQL databases are running on a uh, running on a local system, you have the possibility where normally SQL injection was a uh, was a server based. Uh, you know, you, this was you attacking a server, trying to get data off a remote database. Um, and if you had, uh, for instance, cross site scripting flaws, you would use them to try and steal a user's authenticated session, log in, and do stuff as them. Um, because you're now storing uh, data locally, you actually have the case, um, you, know, you have the possibility for SQL injection if you can pass parameters in. Um, some frameworks let you parameterize and some just let you, you know, want you to write raw SQL. Um, but uh, there's also uh, there's a, a neat scenario here, which is that if you go to a website that has cross-site scripting flaws uh, and you, you, know, you go to your webmail site and you've got some data cached locally in your database, you can actually have pre-authentication cross-site scripting flaws um, that can steal this data and shuffle them off elsewhere. Uh, so you don't even have to actually wait for people to be logged in anymore to, um, to steal or destroy any of the data that they're storing, um, which, which makes uh, you know, cross-site scripting kind of an, an interesting uh, an interesting attack. Um, so there's a couple of things that are specific to Firefox 3 that I'll go through here real quick. Um, the Up until beta 2, they were still uh, considering pushing uh, cross-site XML HTTP requests uh, with no real defining policy in there. Uh, thankfully, it was pulled out before Firefox 3 shipped. Um, but as near as I can tell, that's still an open issue. Um, so if people have any pressure they can exert on Firefox to not do that, they should exercise it. 
Um, it also has uh, a global storage mechanism. And this kind of highlights part of the problem with some of these frameworks, which is that people are, uh, you would think that a standards process would work where people would write a standard and uh, review it and then go implement it in products. And that's not how standards work at all. Uh, what happens is people write a draft standard that's kind of half done and has some ideas they've been kicking around. Um, and the technology implementers, the browser vendors, have been looking at those and saying, wow, this particular feature is kind of neat. We're just going to implement it now. Um, so that happened with global storage. Uh, it was then pulled from the HTML5 spec um, because it wasn't a very good idea. Uh, it allows you to just use named data stores um, and with actually uh, pretty small uh, domain restrictions, uh, Firefox 2s were particularly bad. And of course, nobody knew that Firefox 2 had this mechanism. Um, and there was no UI to actually let people know that this new uh, storage and tracking mechanism had been inserted. Um, another thing, the strange thing with Firefox 3 is that you have a whole ton of data that's not relational in SQLite databases um, that uh, open up some, some other uh, interesting attacks. Um, there's actually, if people are interested, there's a lot of stuff that went into Firefox 3 that's really interesting. Um, if you go to a page called uh, Firefox 3 for developers, um, there are a whole host of um, new services that are, many of which can be their own research project. Um, you know, support for the extended extensible style sheet language. Um, I guess it didn't have enough extension mechanisms in it already, so they needed a more extended version. Um, um, there's uh, the uh, NS idle service uh, XPCOM uh, method, which allows for tracking uh, how long users have been at their computer and if they're going away, things like that. Um, there's also uh, one of the uh, one of the probably not best ideas that went into Firefox 3 uh, is that uh, well, it's actually it's not a bad idea. Uh, what happens is now you can use uh, other websites as protocol handlers. So if your favorite uh, site for sending email or your email program of choice effectively is Gmail, um, you can uh, go ahead and tell the browser that I would like to hand use Gmail to handle this instead of spawning Thunderbird or Outlook. Um, but uh, the protocol handlers are another place where verification is, is really weak. Um, this is just a, a very small snippet of code here um, that asks for a user to say, um, to use their site as a protocol handler. Um, so since transmission of mail is something that's uh, good for an attacker to, to take a look at, uh, you know, for snooping on users, uh, you can actually just put in an I, uh, you know, put in your site by IP address. Um, the only actual restriction on installing protocol handlers is that the malicious site and the site that the protocol handler refers to has to be the same, uh, which isn't actually a restriction at all. Um, so here's what it actually looks like if you try and use a, um, a third-party uh, protocol handler uh, in Firefox. You can see there's a, do you want to allow Yahoo Mail, something that you don't understand, and then uh, an, as an application for mail two links. And your options are add application, or you can kind of close the dialog, but mostly just add the application if you would. Um, and this, the, the funny thing here is that when you actually add a, a, a protocol handler, it'll do things. Uh, Firefox already actually knows about Yahoo Mail, and it knows where to send stuff for that. And that's the second option here. Uh, but the, the actual malicious snippet up there, um, what it does is it actually goes through, uh, it follows the link, finds the fav icon, and decides to use that as the icon for your new protocol handler. Uh, not only that, but in uh, Windows XP, it makes it so it's gray on gray, so you can't actually, there's an IP address under there, um, but you can't can't tell what it is. Um, so what you actually have happen is you get a this um, more real than the real thing protocol handler that uh, would make people accept, uh, you know, choose a malicious one over the real one, um, like hyper real or a simulacra or something. Um, so uh, I'm going to go pretty quick through WebKit. Um, but suffice it to say that WebKit is actually, they were a pretty early adopter of some of these uh, local storage mechanisms. Um, they've had uh, SQL database support for a while. Um, and it's in a lot of stuff. Um, it's actually, Nokia is the second biggest user of WebKit um, after Apple um, because it's based in, the, it's what's used on the iPhone, it's what's used on uh, Safari. Uh, a lot of people probably don't know that you can do things like use local SQL databases for storage there. Um, but it's also an open moco, uh, and it's what's, uh, you know, what Air uses for its rendering engine. Um, 
So part of the problem with these storage mechanisms, other than the fact that you can do tracking with them, is that they're all basically capped at five megs, um, and they're all per origin. Um, you know, the origin being the uh, you know the classical thing. If you have a you know 10,000 domain names, you've got 10,000 origins, um, and they don't. Ha you can just have them be subdomains of a, a main site. So you have 15 megs per origin, uh, and anybody that's actually got wildcard DNS or a whole bunch of names or is on an internal network can actually uh, fill up your hard drive uh, pretty quickly in a, in a matter of, a, depending on your hard drive capacity, uh, it could be um, f five minutes to, say, ten minutes. Um, but uh, you can actually make this stuff grow out of control really quickly. That's actually really important if you've got a mobile device, uh, because if you've only got, say, eight gigs of storage, and you can take it all out, and you're pooling your storage with your actual um, with your actual RAM, uh, you can kind of not brick permanently, uh, but you can make these devices pretty much unusable. And there's no way to actually disable these mechanisms uh, that's easily available. Thanks. Um, so there's some sample code. If you can, you can pick up the slides afterwards um, that kind of show how you do this kind of stuff. Uh, one other little quirk about this kind of stuff is that uh, you can uh, you can actually insert a bunch of Base64 encoded data um, that forensics programs will try and pick up. Uh, so you can use this to shove tons of arbitrary content, uh, inappropriate images or things that people aren't supposed to be in possession of, um, and litter the user's hard drive with them while you're doing your little DOS attack. Um, and this, this also uh, works quite well in practice. HTML5 is a kind of is a weird beast. I encourage uh, everybody to read the specification. Um, there's security so far has not been part of the standards process. Um, the only thing that's actually in it is that there's a note that it needs to be written someday. Um, but the spec is pretty uh, it's pretty much approaching completion as near as I can tell, uh, and it's something that should probably go in a little bit earlier than earlier than the very end. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Alex to kind of talk about uh, some of the more interesting uh, and uh, ways that you can use these RIA frameworks to attack users and uh, what you can do about them. Thanks. Okay, so to wrap it up, let's go through some of the, the new kind of attacks that we're facing in the RIA Web 3.0 world. Sorry I said that, but... Um, to throw it out there, um, some of the new things. So attacks of reapplications against the operating system. Um, we have now local storage, which, as David pointed out, there's a lot of privacy and tracking concerns because either UIs don't exist or the UIs for wiping out or turning this stuff off are not integrated with UI UIs for cookies. So just about when uh, people started figuring out how to turn off cookies or clear them appropriately, um, we now have new local storage mechanisms that they don't understand. We've started to see this with people, banks using Flash cookies, and Flash is a local storage mechanism to track their customers, and they call that, uh, you know, uh, uh, dual authentication. Um, that you know, we also have a denial of service risk, um, like he said, by by using multiple domains to five five megabytes times infinity is still infinity, right? So um, having a limit that then can be used over and over again gives you a denial of service epic mechanism. Um, from a malware perspective, probably Adobe Air is the most concerning here, just because it, it does have uh, as designed full privileges locally, um, although. All of these frameworks are adding new huge attack surfaces, right? The fact that an entire SQL database is embedded in your browser and called callable by, by malicious JavaScript is, is huge, right? Because now you have every kind of command that you can do in SQLite you can execute um, locally. And if SQLite has an overflow, now you have a, a, a very rich, broad attack surface. And anybody who's ever read um, the errata on a single Oracle patch will understand how difficult it is uh, to write something like a SQL uh, interpreter uh, that is secure. Um, and the uh, error si situation, uh, you're talking about uh, people you know, using the install box and trying to trick people into install it, having a malware issue. Um, from a web perspective, uh, we now have a very interesting issue where cross-site scripting pre-login becomes much more powerful, right? Um, cross-site scripting against a webmail app used to only be useful if the person had an active cookie, which for a lot of times they would, right? Or you'd have to do uh, uh, a trick. You'd have to trick the person into logging in um, and then have the cross-site scripting execute afterwards. Um, now with local data storage, if I can do a referred cross-site scripting, I can do it in an invisible iframe. They don't have to log in or have a local cookie. It can just run and pull all of your cached email out of the local data storage and send it, right? Right. So pre-authentication cross-site scripting with the local domain storage and local SQL storage um, in Gears and HTML5 uh, is, is very frightening and adds a lot more power to cross-site scripting attacks that were kind of useless before. Um, 
we now have SQL injection in JavaScript. Your web app, not the, the database behind it, but the, the JavaScript that runs to make your, your web 2.0 app run can have a SQL injection vulnerability. Um, and that's not a good thing, right? Because the people that write the JavaScript and write the HTML are not the same people that write the web app, uh, the, you know, the JDBC calls and the ODBC calls, the people that understand what SQL injection is in the past. Um, so we're talking about a whole new group of generally graphic design kind of people that sit at Ritual Roasters in San Francisco with their MacBook Airs and their thick glasses, um, and there are lots of piercings that those kinds of people now are going to have to worry about SQL injection. They've never had to do it before. Um, CSRF is something interesting from RIA apps. We can't really cover that too much. Um, in the case of Prism, we have the sandbox apps that can affect each other and do all of the nasty XP com stuff. Um, in the case of Browser Plus, you have modules that are running with full executable locally. Um, and as David said, things like Image Magic, which has all of these algorithms that are extremely dangerous, have had buffer flows in the past. Um, we can also chain these frameworks together. You can run, launch an air application from inside a Prism app, for example. Um, and so there are there is some concern there. Um, so some checklists: if you're a RIA developer, um, your data stores for local SQL or or structured data, use um, non-predictable GUIDs, use parameterized SQL if you can, although that's not always possible, um, lock your app to your domain, um, some other stuff. You guys are bad guys, so we'll, we'll skip ahead. Um, for If you're a security professional, our, our recommendations are um, looking at the attack surface, such as the IL parser to the new virtual machines, embedded HTML rendering. Um, if you're a corporate admin, don't let your, your users install RIA frameworks. Uh, you can use something like group policy objects to do this in, in, active, uh, in IE. Not sure how you do it in Firefox. Um, you, if you're a normal person, don't install a RIA framework in case you, unless you actually need it. Um, read the install boxes carefully uh, and get ready for the apocalypse. Um, if you're a penetration tester, um, look for uh, dangerous uh, parameters passed into something like an error application on instantiation. Um, make sure people are using parameterized SQL statements. Um, make sure that data stores, uh, if possible, are using GUIDs for naming conventions, so cross-site scripting attacks might not be able to find them. Um, look for limits on storage mechanisms. Um, make sure people are using SSL with these mechanisms because they're so dangerous. If you pull down executable code that can use them over HTTP, uh, you now have a much more uh, bigger issue than people like stealing cookies. Um, so in conclusion, uh, these RIA frameworks are very widely different in what they can do in, the, in their security models. Um, it is extremely likely that using these RIA frameworks that web developers are going to introduce all kinds of new, very interesting flaws um, that in web applications as well as things are supposed to be desktop applications. Uh, and the web is becoming less standardized, which is the whole point, right? This is all about corporate control of which of these companies is going to control the API inside of the browser. Um, so breaking standardization is, is what you have to do if you want to monopolize the browser. Um, but from that perspective, if it's making security a little harder, um, it's making things a lot more dangerous. So I don't think we have time for Q&A because I'm getting some kind of you're going to die, cut, cut, cut sign. Um, so we'll step off the stage if you want to ask questions, and we'll also be in room 115. 115 for a breakout session if you have questions or comments. So thank you for coming.